So today I'm going to go back to one of my manual cycles before I did e-bike, uh, but of course this route is easier to do with an e-bike. Uh, and that is one of the reasons I started cycle touring uh, in order to visit Neolithic sites in Ireland and to visit them at a speed I felt is more in keeping with the way uh, the people who built them would have travelled between them. Uh, I've a playlist with a, a few of these on it now in terms of both Ireland, Scotland and Anglesey and Wales uh, where it was going around. But anyway, so today uh, we're getting the train to start off with from Dublin to uh, Ballymoat, uh, which is where the journey back starts. And then from Ballymoat we're doing a very short trip uh, to Kish, the Caves of Kish, which is this first stop here, the number one. Um, after visiting the caves, I'm then going to go on to the megalithic complex at Carrow Keel. I think there's 40 or 50 uh, monuments there. Um, that's currently shut. I'll talk about that in a while. Uh, and then I go on to Boyle where I spend the night. Uh, and then the next day I get up and I cycle to Rathcrongan uh, where I'm visiting two places. Uh, one is the Cave of the Cats, which is... Uh, sometimes given as one of the original sites of Halloween and the other is the, is the main RH fort at Rathcrongan and some of the outlying forts around it. Uh, and then after with those visits done uh, I then set out on what turns out to be a very very long cycle uh, back towards Dublin. Uh, I have a hotel booked in Mullingar here um, so I'll bring you through that, uh, but most of this cycle happens along the Royal Canal. Uh, so this is before the Royal Canal has been opened up fully. Uh, it's much more open now. I'll talk about that as we go along. Stop overnight at Mullingar and then I follow the Royal Canal back uh, on the way to Dublin. As I said, that's now much more open than it was at the time I've done it. And I'll, I'll talk about where the differences are there. So let's have a look at the details of the trip. So this was the first time I'd taken the bike on the train. Uh, uneventful enough, I was quite nervous about it, but it wasn't really a problem. Uh, so there was a lashing day, pouring rain. Uh, looking at the window getting to Longford, I was worried about just how long this was actually going to go on for. Uh, there's a brief glimpse of a dolmen just after you go past Boyle. I had hoped to come back to this the following day, uh, but I was too exhausted from the cycling, so I wasn't quite up to it. Uh, but as I got down towards Ballymote, the weather finally started to clear, kind of the low cloud lifting from the hills, and there was some hope. Uh, and indeed, Ballymote itself, the castle, is just a couple of minutes' walk from the train station. I think that might be the train station in the background, uh, and worth stopping off to spend a few minutes there. Uh, it's one of those uh, very large Anglo-Norman castles. Uh, that was built uh, after the invasion of Ireland by the Normans and they're going to pop up a few times in terms of the story of the sites we're looking at today. This is another view of the back of the castle. So this will be the first uh, day, or really the first afternoon and evening cycle. Uh, first of all I had a problem to deal with which is when I uh, got to Ballymoat and went to visit the castle and went to lock my bike I discovered that in my eagerness to save weight I'd accidentally left the key ring that the bike lock was on at home uh, that caused me a bit of panic uh, because I was going to be staying in hotels and B&Bs on this trip so I was sure I needed to lock my bike outside at some point uh, so I scouted around Ballymoat and fortunately there was a hardware shop and uh, they sold a couple of not very great quality but they'll do in a pinch like locks so that sort saved me for the trip um so looking at the route uh, today i'm valley moat getting the train there then we're coming down here to catch kareen which is this hill with the caves in it uh, then coming around here to karakil uh, and then on in the evening down to Boyle. so in a bit more detail um so the Ballymoat stretch to Kesh uh, it's a regional road, it's a little busy but it's it's fine. Um, and you come off it here as you get closer to uh, Kesh um, I will put in some footage uh, of the caves, uh, but essentially there's a, a car parking space with a couple of stone seats in it. And then it's a very steep ascent up to where the cave mouths are. Uh, and then you can go in and wander around the caves. There's no, um, I mean, it's, there's no uh, access control over it whatsoever you can just walk up i would 
it was pretty wet the day I was doing it, which meant it was pretty slippy. So I'd say that's the one thing to watch because you definitely would not want to be sliding down that slope. It's quite unpleasant. So here's a view looking up from the bottom. You can imagine that being wet and muddy. Now there is a path that goes up, so it's not quite as treacherous as it looks. Uh, and then once you're up there, you can pop into the caves and have a wander around. Excavations have revealed quite a large amount of animal bones from the caves and a few small human ones, mostly teeth. Uh, and there is the suggestion that perhaps uh, bodies were left here to decay and then the bones taken up the mountains. They were used for human habitation from about the 10th century on and also the annals of the Four Masters records a bishop being murdered in the caves to suffocation. Uh, there's certainly lots of folk tales around them involving Finn McCool and other legendary figures but in terms of this particular trip perhaps the most intriguing one is a story from I think 1776 of a woman being lured into the Hellmouth at Rathcrongan. We're going to be looking at that tomorrow and emerging the following morning from the caves in Kesh. So there's a story for you. A fine view from up on top anyway. And now let's listen to them. Uh, then after that trip to the uh, caves. Uh, I was then following the road down and around up towards Karakil. Now particularly this stretch of the road it's extremely quiet. Also as you can see down here extremely steep. Um, but that's a very pleasant cycle providing you don't mind the hills too much. Uh, and then there's a kind of gravel track that then runs up um, into the valley uh, and you can follow it around to just below where the tombs are. Uh, there's a, si a metal signpost there that I locked the bike to and then hiked my way up. As you approach the valley, you'll see cairns on the surrounding hills. It's thought this area was settled by cattle farmers from Brittany uh, about 4000 BC. And it's certainly fascinating that this is sort of the other end of the Tain Trail coming from Cooley, uh, which is uh, an Irish myth about cattle raiding. Uh, so perhaps some old folk memories there. The bogs you see here are actually younger than the Carns were. They weren't here originally when they were built. Well, this is definitely one of the more unusual places I've sheltered from rain. Uh, it's raining pretty heavy outside and on top of a mountain. But fortunately, 6,000 years ago, uh, some very nice people built this car and, and it's pretty waterproof. There's no lights in here, so you can't really see much of it, I'm afraid. If that's the entrance, which is a little bit of a tight squeeze to get in and out of. Uh, and there's nobody else on the mountain. So uh, if it's haunted or anything, I'm going to be in a lot of trouble. As far as I'm aware, there's never been a proper archaeological uh, dig of these kinds. Uh, there were a dozen of them, I think, uh, hastily excavated in the course of about a week around 1902. However, unfortunately, that uh, Victorian project seems to be more of a treasure hunt than anything else. They did keep bones and things they found in them. Um, and in fact, if I recall correctly, uh, that's enabled some uh, DNA linkage of the people buried here with people later buried in Newgrange. Um, but yes, not really any sort of proper excavation. And unfortunately, it's been the site of recent vandalism, apparently religious vandalism, uh, and the OPW currently have tried to close it off with metal barriers, a very unfortunate action to take. When I was visiting, I thought what a privilege it was to be able to simply walk into a site like this unsupervised. Uh, there's also this interesting erratic boulder here. Um, and if you look around, there are small pieces of white quartz. Now, the original cairns were probably covered in white quartz like this. But unfortunately, that's probably been stripped off in recent decades by uh, treasure hunters and perhaps also people looking for materials for graves. Uh, the last thing of interest here is this uh, feature here, which is a roof box. Uh, so you might be familiar with a similar one at Newgrange that allows the midwinter sun, uh, the solstice sun rather, to shine in and illuminate the back of the chamber. And this seems to have a similar function, but with regards to midsummer. Uh, at midsummer, the sun comes through. Also, as far as I'm aware, if you look through it, as I am here, then you're looking at Knocknery Hill in Sligo in the far distance. That's towards the coast uh, where Queen Maeve's Khan is. That's an enormous Khan on, on top of a hill. 
weather conditions on the day I was there, however, were such that I wasn't going to be able to see far enough to confirm that. Uh, it was back out onto the road and then down, down, down to Boyle. Now, there's actually, a, a, I was surprised by a climb here uh, because there's a pass. Uh, I think it may be the pass where uh, the British Army was ambushed during the Nine Years' War uh, and was was one of the major defeats, uh, Kolu Pass, but I'm not 100% sure about that. They may be further over. Uh, and then down into Boyle. Um, so I had a B&B &B booked in Boyle. Now, Boyle itself uh, kind of hasn't had any of the tourism boom, but it does have a number of sites in it that are worth stopping off. Um, in particular, it's got what may be the oldest stone bridge still in use in Ireland, originally uh, built in connection uh, with the abbey beside it, again from the Norman period. Uh, the abbey itself is also Norman. Uh, and then if you go into the park, uh, which is is by the river in the town, you'll see a, a plinth, uh, and that plinth was originally apparently a statue of William of Orange, uh, but the statue was beheaded and the head thrown in the river. Uh, but even in the period under British rule, uh, the statue kept getting vandalised and thrown in the river, so he was never a very popular figure, it has to be said. But that's Boyle. So my second day was one of those things where I learned a lesson uh, and also uh, makes my switch to an e-bike for most of my touring quite sensible. Uh, and I was setting off from Boyle, visiting the Iron Age sites around uh, Rathcrangan, uh, then crossing the Shannon and following the Royal Canal uh, all the way to Mullingar, 120 kilometers away. And to be honest, that turned out to be a little bit too much. <laughs> so I'll give you some details of that as we go along the route. Uh, initially coming out of Boyle, we've lots of nice quiet country roads, uh, same through about Crangan. Uh, then that's kind of like uh, I was running short of time and kind of been aware, so I made the mistake of switching to the national roads uh, as I approached the Shannon around Strokestown. Um, and that, let me tell you, was extremely unpleasant because it was lashing rain and I was being passed by articulated lorries at a distance of about a metre doing 100k. Uh, so that was definitely felt like I was going to die. Uh, so uh, I would stick to my actual planned route rather than the route I took on that bit. It's just not worth it for the extra speed. Um, and then once you're across the Shannon, you pretty quickly get onto the Royal Canal. And so then it's in fact, it's a greenway cycle all the way to Mullingar, a good distance away. Um, unfortunately, I was completely soaked to the skin and exhausted. And I had a lucky get out of jail free card because a friend had earlier said to me, uh, look, if you get stuck, give me a ring. She lives near Mullingar. Uh, so I, I called that card in about 20 kilometers out as it was getting dark. I was hungry and I was cold and I was realizing that maybe I was going to end up with hypothermia. Uh, but anyway, made Mullingar and my hotel that night that way. Some details on this. Thankfully, I started the day with a substantial breakfast at the bed and breakfast. Uh, it was lashing rain as I headed down, but lots of nice quiet roads. I didn't actually cycle down this one uh, till I got to the cave of the cats. Uh, so this is a natural cave, but there's about 10 metres of tunnel built to it uh, in the Iron Age. Uh, it seems to have been a centre of... Um, worship I guess you would say or ceremony uh, so I'll leave these two boards up for you to have a look at the details of it and now I am sitting many many uh, kilometers away inside the actual gates of hell uh, or as it's called the cave of the cats this is the opening to the underworld and it's very dark when you look into it the tunnel goes that way I'm not sure about this place. If you do visit and you do enter it, be sure to have a look at the ohm writing on the lintel above the door. 
Then it was on to Rathcrongan itself, uh, where there's a display board that tells you the story of the Tain and the site's connection to it. Uh, there's a whole load of mounds basically in the area. Uh, they're a bit underwhelming in actual person because they're basically just grass covered mounds. Uh, but obviously structures were built on these uh, and I'll leave up these information boards here for you to read up more about it. Uh, it was also very drizzly and wet. I was suffering quite badly on this particular day. So here I'm standing on top of the main mound and I'm looking back towards the cave of the cats in the trees over there uh, and then here's the insert with how that mound is thought to have looked back in the day uh, when this site was in use. Uh, quite hard as you can see to just imagine it from just standing here so that's quite a useful illustration. Now the plan from here was to continue cycling along nice quiet country roads to the Shannon. Uh, however, I was getting absolutely soaked uh, and it was getting near lunchtime. So I decided I would go to Strokestown to get a meal in a hotel. And when there I realized I was falling way behind schedule. So I made the foolish decision to cut onto the main road for a while. Terrible experience. Don't do it. Just follow the route I have on the map. I arrived at Termin Barry to discover the bridge was raised. Uh, this is the bridge of the River Shannon, Ireland's biggest river, uh, which is navigable by boats for most of its length. Uh, so the lower bridges have to be capable of lifting up like this. A small delay, but actually I quite enjoyed watching the boat lift in operation. The Clondara Harbour at the western end of the Royal Canal is just a short distance away and from here it was about 65 kilometres along the canal to Mullingar. Uh, now as I mentioned at the start I was cold, I was wet, it started to get dark and I basically called a friend for that last 20 kilometres because I reckoned all I was going to do on my own was get hypothermia. So my third and last day of this particular trip uh, was waking up in Mullingar and getting back on that Royal Canal route and cycling back home to Dublin. Now, as I said at the start of the video, um, at that point in time, there was much less work had actually been done on the route. And in fact, there was a, a part where I was completely forced off it. Uh, they were putting the finishing touches uh, crossing a rail line, basically. Now that bit is actually a nice safe thing. Uh, safe uh, passage, it's grand. But back then, you then had to go onto the roads and kind of do this long loop around. Um, I kept going all the way to Maynooth. I tried to cycle after Maynooth, but was pretty much forced off because it was it's a dirt track and onto kind of back roads. Uh, if you check my more recent uh, uh, Royal and Grand Canal Loop video, I cover this section coming back from Mullingar and it's much more up to date. Uh, it still doesn't really connect through fully to Dublin, but you can even get a little bit further than Maynooth. The track there for some reason seems to have improved, even though it hasn't been uh, actually covered. The intention uh, will be to have uh, a route that runs all the way from Dublin to Mullingar, down, then down to Athlone via the Greenway Trail, that does exist at the moment, and then from Athlone all the way over to Galway uh, as part of one of the Eurovelo routes, but at the moment that's still very much under construction. Uh, so a couple of details though from that particular trip. Once you're a couple of kilometres out of Mullingar, the canal becomes quite isolated. It's in quite a deep cut and then there's a long period where it's going over a bog and it's quite flooded on both sides. And one aspect I definitely enjoyed was seeing the old infrastructure along it. They had small bridges, some of them still in use, uh, some of them looking like they've been abandoned a very long time indeed. Uh, the canal is a great bit of Irish history, the two canals, the Grand and the Royal Canal, uh, both over 200 years old at this point and stretching way out from Dublin right across the country uh, to the Shannon. Um, in their day, they were quite an engineering feat, in particular the aqueducts over, I think, both the Boyne and the Liffey. I think this is the one that crosses the River Boyne. 
Uh, and then there's lots of old abandoned houses along the route as well. In more recent years, a lot of these, of course, being brought back into use because of the housing crisis. Uh, and then as you get towards Dublin, it all gets a bit more cultivated. Um, and they had done a lot more work even at this stage on the Greenway route. There were relatively few houseboats on it. I took a picture, pictures of the few I passed. In recent years, that number has exploded, particularly again as you get close to Dublin. An awful lot of people uh, are now living in the canal harbours. Uh, and Waterway Ireland, in fact, has been kind of putting pressure on people and particularly putting rents up quite considerably. The shoe memorials you pass at intervals remember the Great Famine of 1840s um, when people walked along the canal to get to Dublin which is more or less where we are. And here's two last segments, very close to Dublin now, uh, one of which has now been paved, and the other soon will be as part of that Greenway. Well, I hope you found that particular trip down memory lane to the days before I e-bike toured useful. Um, that is a great route. I would thoroughly recommend it, in particular if you've an interest in the Neolithic. Uh, if you're new to the channel, there are currently about 145 videos here. Uh, a mixture of how-to guides to all aspects of bikepacking in general and e-bike touring in particular. Um, my most popular video by far being the one that answers the question, how do you keep your batteries charged even while you're wild camping? I've managed that. Uh, and then uh, probably a bit about half my videos are reports of the cycles I've been doing. Um, so far, I've cycled around the Irish coastline. That's a much larger distance than you might expect. There are 40 day-by-day -day diaries there. Uh, and I also went over to Scotland last summer and spent a month cycling around the islands and the highlands, all the way up to Orkney in the north, in fact. Um, so you'll find the videos uh, both in terms of a breakdown of that whole trip, but also day-by-day -day diaries. Uh, if you think that's interesting, you should definitely give the channel a follow and hit the subscribe button. Um, if you found this particular video interesting, and you must if you're still watching it at this stage, then please do give it a like. Uh, it helps the algorithm know to get out to more people. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say is this summer I'm heading off to northern Spain and the Basque Country uh, to do a 2,000 kilometer trip from Bilbao out to the coast. Uh, both south and north of the mountains and through the mountains. Uh, and I'll be posting photos from that live as I do it to my Instagram account. It's also e-bike touring life. Uh, so if you're on Instagram, give me a follow there. Uh, you'll get things as they happen. I use YouTube for the more thought out and edited end of things, uh, whether or not you find it all thought out and edited. Anyway, see you on the road and thanks for watching.